Okay, so uh, question, Corvin, did you have a chance in Vienna to talk to John about further integration of your work? I did only talk to him uh, for a short period of time, so not much. Okay. Hopefully the face-to-face -face introduction alone was, was good. And thank you so much for giving a talk. Um, that was great. And <clears throat> Patrick should have those up thank pretty you. soon for everyone to enjoy. Should, should you have either missed one or are curious. Let's see. Uh, and Hans, have you heard anything from Vitali? And either way, uh, breaking news might suggest that uh, I sure hope he'll be available to help in some way. But if he's being like mobilized, that is flat out terrifying. Um, I didn't hear anything from Vitali. But um, if there's need in helping out with that issue, I can, I can help. How is your overall availability? Pretty good right now. I'm starting a new project uh, in October. Ah, that okay. That is relatively soon. But until it's uh, going, um, and until that will require most of my time, that will be a couple of weeks left, I guess. Did you wrap up so, your previous project? Yeah, pretty much. It's How'd it go? The last last bits out out for review, and um, so that that doesn't take much time anymore. And the next one is still out. Well, officially, I'm starting probably if if I can get a contract going um, in October. Could could be delayed by whatever reasons. But yeah, in, in general, I I can help if Vitali doesn't want to continue it. I think he wants to, but. Um prevailing winds might prevent that. We should both reach out to him as soon as yeah. this finishes. Um, do you have access to AMD hardware? Um, I have access to relatively old AMD hardware. Uh, do you know I the chip a, model? Um, it's a bulldozer. So it's bulldozer. pre Zen. Got it. I, I guess in theory, I could give you OpenVPN access to my yeah. Oh, 7402P, I believe it is the chip. Question that, really is, did, did that much change in the hardware that is necessary? But yeah, that would probably help. So his patch appeared to work, but then it blew up on AMD. So he was going to revisit then that in October, but we should reach out pretty soon while there's okay. turmoil in the world. So let's, <coughs> excuse me. Let's both uh, do that. I will write after the meeting. Yeah, I'll, yeah, okay. Okay, cool. Uh, and did you take time to, at any point to orient yourself with this code? Uh, not, not yet, really. I was quite swamped with other yeah, stuff. Yeah, you had a big old project. Um, so maybe do take a moment to just see what's there sure. and uh, if anything, get a sense of what might be Platform specific meaning Intel versus AMD. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Can take a look. <clears throat> Let's see. Corbin, was that one of your first BSD conferences? Yes. So How? I had a talk um, in the previous Vendor Summit 2021. Yep. Uh, yeah, but it was a virtual event. So. Yep. It's a bit different. <laughs> it's, it is a bit different. Uh, <laughs> how would you, uh, do you have any experiences to share with the group? Although Jan was there and obviously I was there too, but um, what are your takeaways? Because uh, I, I, I lack perspective on it, having been a bit close to it. So yeah, I think there were some interesting talks. Um, yeah, but... Um, I don't know if there are some interesting talks for this group here. And uh, so I think so, but um, yeah, everyone has something uh, different, which 
is interesting, uh, interesting as well. Cool. I will say there were a lot of jail talks, surprisingly, that in room three, especially like three in one day. That was a surprise. Oh. And again, the video should be up pretty soon. Jan, what were your impressions, positive and negative? About, um, sorry, does my audio- About the conference. Up? I hear you. Okay. Um, what I noticed was um, lack of understanding between different groups of users. So for example, the Jels tutorial where made it obvious that almost everyone was superficially familiar with ZFS, but uh, they lack the, or at least half the participants probably more lack the networking background to make use of a the uh, full feature set. So uh, connecting these communities would be valuable. Even uh, Luca, the uh, pod developer freely admitted that as a jail manager developer and which is aiming at data center scale orchestration, uh, he lacks a proper networking background to uh, evaluate which backends make even sense to uh, try. So, so I admit it is maybe a bit. Um, I will be first to admit that I also am stronger in storage than networking, as you've painfully seen in practice. So, what have you seen? help bridge those groups? Um, I, what I've seen is a bit of hallway track discussion on it. Yeah. Especially around the <laughs> uh, the centralized feeding place. Uh, but other than that, not much, uh, which is really why we should do better. And it doesn't matter much if it's jails with VNet or uh, Beehive guests uh, both need similar network backends. Are you the one who mentioned the four types of learning and documentation? Yes, and I've sent you the uh, yeah. What the links the channel uh, did you send that in of my uh, dozen Twitter. or so channels? Twitter. Yeah, Great. Twitter direct message. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm still catching up on all the inflow of information from. So, um, Got it. So nobody can be an expert on on everything, or, or very few at least can. No, so what's the Baldwin problem is that we are, uh, <laughs> uh, if we demand that every new user has a deep understanding of every technology stack, uh, remotely um, touching their deployments, uh, we are just restricting our, ourselves to a very tiny user group probably too small to sustain development. <laughs> Fascinating. Do others have observations on that? Especially like, Andrew, you're in an environment where you, I'm sure you need some, some ZFS, some networking, a little of, you name it, system administration. And how do you acquire those skills if you have a foundation of some? Lots of reading. Lots of <laughs> Are you okay? I like that. Hanging out in meetings like these, but, but um, and a lot of it, and a lot of just ex experimenting. But I, I don't think that necessarily gets to the real point of Jan's, what Jan's saying, because having the ex having the expectation of somebody having such a wide coverage of, of this type of information is just probably not reasonable. That's why I brought it up um, because I, I sometimes uh, see in online communities around BSD is that um, some old farts just um, drive off new users 
telling them, oh, unless you know this, this, and this, why are you even trying or something like and that? And they're jerks about it, yes. They're, either they're jerks about it or they, what? at least if they're jerks about it, they will drive some of them, not just away, but uh, to learn in defiance, but even worse, as the uh, sentiment that, oh, this is too hard for you, just give up and use this whopper. You don't want to understand it, you shouldn't. And to that, I mean, to that point, that's a problem Linux had for a long time that's gotten a lot better about. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, you look at the network stack from, from Linux in the 90s, <laughs> it was pretty rough. You look, you know, you look at today, uh, it mostly just works out of the box. So it kind of works out of the box. Mostly. <laughs> but on the other hand, we have things like, uh, I don't know, Kubernetes single host deployment, uh, which just you run a shell script and everything happens automatic automatically and uh, you're not to, supposed to question it. Which is also problematic because if the technology stack gets too bloated, not, nobody can understand it alone. If you need a seven uh, person team just to keep up with the basic maintenance, that's, that may make sense for something like Netflix, but not for you and me. Oh, we have to find a balance, and that was um, why I brought up the um, four types of uh, technical documentation, tutorials, which are learning oriented, but in practical steps, how to guides, which care more about the uh, goal, so goal oriented, without going for a deeper understanding, then reference manual, where you only want to learn how a specific thing works and then explanations or understand, which are also going for understanding, but more deeper discussions and design questions, yeah. I've sent you the link via chat as well, Michael. Yeah, I know. I, there I am, like, sending again. it through my wife's Skype and jumping around. <laughs> and of course, you sent it to me. Thank you for I mean, that. Um, You're very good about that. The whole thing with how-to with, with how guides, I tend to try to avoid those because I usually find that whatever they're saying how to do mm -hmm. is not exactly what I'm looking for. And so I need to exactly. have a fuller understanding anyway. Exactly. You do, but often you want to know to get a feel for something. Maybe how could this look? How how could it work? Isn't uh, the downside is this, if it's too easy, which also came up during the jail um, uh, tutorial. That uh, well, it was a bit confusing for the less for the real target audience, both fairly new to jails, because the uh, slides um, didn't make a clear difference between what's supposed to be an interactive command, what belongs in a config file, and uh, what is only a shortcut. And so yeah, it could have been better. And I do want to get around to give, provide the proper feedback, uh, the, um, the ask, uh, designer asked for, so yeah. Who because, gave that tutorial? I forget. Ah, uh, so did I. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, I. Um, it was a few hectic day. It was a hectic four days. <laughs> yeah, it's easily looked up. Anyhow, not that yeah, we're here to beat still up on it. Available them, in the program page. Uh, and we all have was... something to learn, even experienced presenters. Uh, Dave Kotler, Uber. Oh yeah, Dave. He's yeah, he's local. He's yeah, yeah. Okay, and New Zealander. Kindly got me from the airport. <laughs> hmm. Um. Excuse but, me for two um, seconds while I let a dog in. Go ahead, a moment. So, So what I found is if I want to uh, learn something new, um, a short tutorial 
on how to get it by the get, uh, getting started guide, followed by a few uh, how to's or on how to accomplish certain yeah useful goals with the tool I'm evaluating. It's a good way to quickly judge is it worth spending my time to go deeper into the uh, explanations how the things are supposed to work, how it's implemented, uh, reading white papers, and then follow up with reference documentation. What I found in the BSDs is that we often have quite good reference documentation in the form of main pages, but those are only useful if you already know how the things fit together. This yeah, is where problem. something like the handbook used to be a lot more useful, but it fell behind the development because the old documentation stack was so arduous to learn. The the pro yeah the problem with man pages is that you have to know where you're st where to start. Discovery is a problem. No. Like if, if you well if you don't if you don't know what say command you're looking for, the exactly. man page doesn't it's, help. It's not discovery so far as it uh, it answers that's a specific question. For example, how do I invoke this function? What are the arguments or how which uh, sub commands can I give to this executable? It doesn't tell me which executable I need and in which order to run them and why I would even want to. That's where you need some a tutorial to get it, you up to even being in a position to run this specific software, then explanation about what you sh can do with it and so on, and why it's set up the way it is and how to extend it, what to avoid, things like that. But oftentimes I, I want to get a feeling if it's worth spending uh, time on or money or resources, whatever, it requires to run and so many projects have fancy animated landing pages which are a total waste of time <laughs> for every one of the involved the ones writing them as well as the readers because they don't tell you anything except that it's the greatest thing since sliced bread without telling you uh, if it's meant to feed you or uh, poison you. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. And for example, when experimenting with uh, the chem target layer, there is a main page on it. That's almost it. All of the relevant documentation links to specification be behind paywalls and closed registrations for SCSI storage and so on. So it was better uh, than most things because most documentation is behind paywalls when it comes to SCSI? Or at least you have to sign up for an account and only to find out that the part you need is, is only for uh, members, uh, which is a paid account. So one of my points was the success of the MySQL 15 minute rule in the 90s in which the goal was to get anyone up and running in 15 minutes. And then you make that determination. You mentioned mm -hmm. if it's worth continuing, that's very much it. Cause see yeah, our time is limited and we're surrounded by rat holes and we don't need more to go down. Mm -hmm. So I guess we can all work on that. If, if. Then. Other observations, Hans, Corvin? No. No. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, Corvin, I'm guessing you woke up one morning not aware of Beehive and then you were suddenly developing on it. Can you describe <laughs> that very early transition from zero knowledge to uh, sticking your nose in the code? How did you get started? So, uh, before I got started with Beehive, I had some experience uh, with uh, developing hypervisors. On what platforms, if I may? 
So, um, yeah, while studying, I uh, wrote a small mini hypervisor for AMD CPUs. Um, so I was familiar with this technology. I wasn't just unfamiliar with, um, yeah, how uh, the hive works. And um, yeah, my first project was this GPU pass-through uh, feature. And I've started with the Intel Acron hypervisor because there was a proof of concept um, for GPU pass-through. And so I've tried to get this running and uh, yeah, well, um, after it was running, I took a look into the patches and uh, tried to find out uh, what's different in the Acron hypervisor. Um, and yeah, I had a bit of luck because the Intel Acron hypervisor um, is very similar to Beehive. Um, it was so, Beehive. You can still see mention of Tico and Peter and Neil and company. Yeah, uh, that's what I guess. Uh, so yeah, um, this make it a bit easier for me to find out what uh, Acron makes different than Beehive. Hmm. And um, yeah, this was how I started with Beehive. Okay, well, it's great that you had some actual uh, education on that because uh, another one of my points is that they don't teach storage in any university anywhere. They teach maybe storage uh, privacy and ethics, which is not quite the end of storage that I bump into each day. So I'm very glad that a, a school is teaching meaningful virtualization. I know Mike Larkin, who occasionally is on a call and has presented at BeehiveCon, he's very much teaching virtualization, bless his heart. <clears throat> uh, Hans, any thoughts, observations on, on like, for example, how did, how did you first uh, look at Beehive? <laughs> well, I was asked to, to take ah, a look at the board to Illumis. So, and then- But the, you can do it with an experience with Illumis, I trust? Well, I have worked on Illumis since, well, a couple of years already at the time. Okay. So, uh, and I've never never done anything in terms of virtualization. So this was just um, me being thrown into cold water. Okay, okay. And well, it kind of worked out. <laughs> yeah. So, how would everyone rank there on a scale of uh, one to 10 there? raw networking knowledge and experience as it applies to virtualization. I won't take notes, but I'll probably say I'm like a, a four or five. So what do you mean with network knowledge or networking knowledge? Um, I mean, that's a very vague term. I, I generally have left the networking to other people. Just tell me what IP I should use in Gateway and DNS, and I'll take it from there, rather than uh, building networks at the various layers. Um, that's a, it's maybe a skewed question, but um, Jan had made the point that for the tutorial and even with speakers, they they were finding that they didn't have the prerequisite knowledge, but what does that look like and you know where do where when do we declare somebody adequately informed about such things welcome rodney hadn't seen you there maybe you've been listening in for a little while here i bet you have some some opinions <laughs> i think the last part is an is a loaded question okay and i'll take it back <laughs> because adequately so why do you get to judge them Or rephrase, how can I work on that knowledge? <laughs> I know enough to be dangerous, but hey. Maybe the better question isn't so much, you know, how do you get to that point where 
you have an adequate user base or knowledge base, but to the point where you're convinced enough that it's worthwhile to continue to develop your knowledge base. And it's better than if you're coming from an operator or from a developer mindset. Mm. Do you feel uh, comfortable enough with a technology to depend on it? Or do you uh, feel comfortable enough with a technology to develop with it or based on it? Or do you even feel in a position to judge which technology can solve your problem? Those are three very different things. Rodney, have you been listening along? Yes. How far back? In the chat, I said 15 minutes, but oh, okay. I don't see that, sorry about that. Um, it's all right. There it is, 15 minutes, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting with sharing my yeah. screen, which changes the dynamic. This is for people like Tubner. Yep. And others who I saw it right from the start. Yeah, that, that, I think that's a good idea. That because he's just listening to a recording, right? He's yep, and the name's flashing by, which looks really obnoxious. <laughs> anyway, yeah. My so, understanding uh, of vir 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 virtualization networks is a minus two. <laughs> okay. But what about networking in general? I think you're pretty darn good. <laughs> and I think that to 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 be able to at least administer a virtualization platform, whether it be Beehive or any of the others, you need to have a firm understanding of how hardware layer two, especially layer two networking stuff works. You need to understand bridges. Um, because predominantly most of the hypervising environments present you with a virtual switch, which is just, it's a, vir a switch is a bridge. It's just generally we consider a bridge something with two ports and a switch is something with end ports. And then it got pretty convoluted when you, you add layer three functionality to a switch. But so far as I know, none of the virtualization platforms offer layer three functional V switches. It's all layer two switches. And if you need to do layer three, you do it by creating the VM and bridging all the stuff that you need to into that VM and let the VM do the layer three stuff. Um, I find it unfortunate in the implementation in FreeBSD of our kernel bridge device and the fact that you have to move the IP address onto the bridge, which just for me is, that's not how real hardware works. <laughs> the, the switch, the bridge itself has a, may, may have a management IP address, but that has nothing to do with right. the fact that one of, one of its ports is connected to an ethernet segment that I need to have an IP address on for the host. Of course, um, you're right about that, but um, the problem is that it used, to, that the bridge is the, um, foreign body in the network stack because it, it expects a layer three IP based interface configuration. Um, recently, I think OpenBSD after like three or four attempts got it right. So the, the first try to break out of the uh, flawed um, design, which Linux B and the various BSDs share uh, was their um, switch implementation where they put a forwarding plane to the kernel and attempted to control it with uh, OpenFlow. But this uh, project stalled out and now they have the, I think they call it virtual ethernet bridge or something. And the important thing which I finally got right is that as soon as you add an ethernet-like interface to the bridge, it ceases to be a layer three interface and it's only a layer two interface, which is a bridge member, then you can attach with a virtual ethernet port to the bridge, which is a lot closer to how it should be architectured. So for example, you can now have 
bridge, which is only a data plane and as much of a control plane as is required to make the bridge work, but you don't need any layer free on the OpenBSD system for it. And I think it doubled their uh, switching throughput. Yeah, I, I agree with that is the correct path to take. There should be a, a separate host interface where your IP hangs. It shouldn't it shouldn't That's, hang on the bridge. They already do that on their old bridge, but it has so much crap left over from the last three decades or so. And and, but so for yeah, example, I think they they, have if that's how they've architected it, it's closer to how real switching equipment and also closer to how ESXi implements it. And that you, and, if you're, if the hypervisor needs an IP address, you do so by creating a special host interface into the bridge, into the vSwitch. Yes. And the other important thing is that it simplifies the locking because there are a lot fewer cases you have to consider. For example, the old OpenBSD bridging driver has a, a stateless firewall built in to do a filtering between bridge members. Mm. Do you know if there are any overview documents on their latest incarnation? Um, I think they, there was a slide deck at least on it. And that's one of the things, if you're already a bit familiar with it, the main pages kind of give you enough to read between the lines what changed. Mm. Okay. The important thing is that as soon as it, you add, a, for example, your Ethernet network card to a bridge, you no longer have access to the IP address on it. It's just a member port now. Um, which is how it should be architected. Because later you get a clean separation of concerns between what, setting something like the, the uh, media settings and duplex settings and so on, on the member port, then doing the switch or bridge configuration on the dedicated layer two interface. And then if you want to participate from the host, you attach an additional virtual ethernet port to it, which is then just another port on the switch. So Rodney, for context, uh, Jan attended the jail tutorial in Vienna and some users were a bit weak on networking, some a bit on storage. And the question is broadly, how do we bring people up to speed yet keep them inspired and keep them on topic and uh, let them decide if they go further once they have some basic knowledge to build on. And Jan found a neat link on the four types of, of educational materials that both, I can put it back in the chat there and it's in the doc. Um but if you can solve that problem, I, I, we're set. <laughs> Go ahead, Rod. I saw you. I was here when that occurred. Oh, you were? The, okay. The sorry, four, four points went in, yeah. Oh, sorry, I missed you. I'm not sure how helpful this is on from you guys Please on in. the BSD side, but I know on the Lumo side, <clears throat> when we want to when deal with this stuff, we generally, or at least, I generally don't use a bridged interface. I'm using the, you know, their crossbow thing, and every VM I create gets its own VNIC, and it behaves like you would expect a VNIC to behave, or a, a, a hardware NIC to, to behave. If it needs to pull an IP from DHCP and set that up in the guest OS, okay, that's what it, you know, that's what it does from the network. Or you can, you can do whatever with it. You don't have to have something set specifically to the device and run it over a bridge. The next thing, uh, which is a problem, as the expect performance expectations, sorry, let me try that again. As the uh, performance expectations um, grow, uh, the old model of just uh, bridging tap interfaces doesn't scale up because uh, the tap interface has an inherent design flaw yep. unless we add batching. And so there have been several different attempts to work around with, uh, either very close to the uh, hardware by using a PCI Express pass-through of virtual functions, 
which requires supported hardware and drivers and BIOS settings and so on, uh, which is a minefield to navigate. And the other way is with NetMap, which is at least it used to be very buggy and totally undocumented. I think CBSD uh, is the only project which claims to have working configuration examples to share. Yep. Uh, Rodney was there, be it policy for lack of a better term early on, on, on be it the handbook and other educational materials to guarantee some uh, basic resources beyond manual pages. And heck, when did the handbook even come along? I don't know that there was any policy or anything, but there was a very enthusiastic group of people maintaining the handbook when the handbook started. It was the one of the um, shining stars of the project and the, the, the formulation of the handbook and the fact that it was actually actively maintained so that as things evolved, the, the handbook was very quickly updated and stuff, made it a resource that nobody else had. Um, other un, projects? Un, un, yeah, other projects. And unfortunately, that group of people and that enthusiasm has moved on. I mean, the handbook is huge. That's a it's massive huge. amount yeah. of, of documentation to maintain. And you have a group of developers that seem to have very little interest in maintaining their the external documentation of the internal code they're working on. So it's a, I think it's a mindset and change in the project. I mean, it was always, it was always hard to get people to update man pages. Um, I think that's still hard. And um, the handbook was, it just, it was second removed from that process, but it was done. Uh, Do you know when in the history of the project it, it appeared? Was it super early? I can't remember. It was fairly early. Okay. Um, uh, I can't I can't put a, a release number on it. Okay, that's fine. Other? So as a user um, learning FreeBSD around the FreeBSD 6 and 7 days, and then as FreeBSD moved along and develop, developed further, I found that it stayed with the oldest supported release and always did things the old fashioned way because it worked due to backward compatibility over all releases. So sometimes you had to unlearn something you just learned if you were running the latest production release. And so that's, and Almost no developer is able uh, can write human consumable documentation. So it's good if the developers write man pages for other developers, but having them write proper tutorials, that's a rare skill among developers. Just look at the uh, Trinas and Trinas projects, they pay for actual documentation writers. That's yes, a, but even a, then they stopped maintaining the, the handbook guide. Oh, uh, but their own documentation for yep. Trinas. This is Trinas true. Well. And yeah, the guide had the what I call the 747 cockpit problem where it describes every knob, but it doesn't quite tell you which one you want. <laughs> I'm looking, ahead, looking, at the handbook cop, looking at the handbook copyright, it starts in 1995. Got it. Amazingly, that's kind of what I was thinking because I did have a little bit of experience with BSD back that far. And I thought I remembered it, but it was too vague for me to feel comfortable saying anything. So um, I, because I'm not familiar with Solaris, I just looked up how Crossbow is hooked into the Solaris kernel. Supposedly it 
depends uh, on a suitable network card to handle the classification and partitioning of uh, flows into per ZNAC queues. I understand correctly. So that's not something FreeBSD can rely on that. You only use uh, smart enough network cards. <laughs> can you name a feature specifically that's required? Basically, probably something along decide by MAC address and maybe VLAN or other encapsulation information, which uh, queue to uh, receive the packet into and perform some kind of validation on outgoing Ethernet frames that they're not spoofing to belong to other networks. So that one Beehive or VNet jail couldn't uh, spoof another one's uh, overlay network or something. No. Is anyone no. familiar I with how that's implemented? I know that I, I don't know so much about the implementation, so I can't help that at a low level, but I can say all of the um, NICs that if uh, that we've tried to use, as long as Solaris supports NIC in general, it seems to work just fine. That said, I have very standard hardware across a thousand machines, so I don't have a wide, despite having many machines, I don't have a wide variety of things. Exactly. The network cards you want to run in a virtual machine host probably do support all of the required features and have been done so for ages, but FreeBSD is often run on whatever someone finds in the basement. Yeah, that's fair. Um, can anyone point to exemplary, well-covered topics with, you know, documentation in various forms for users of various ex levels of experience and approaches to learning? And it doesn't have to be within the BSD or Illumo circles. Just anything out there that just is a shiny example we should follow? Because we obviously, um, obviously need help. <laughs> So the handbook used to be in that place and we should try to get back to the, the quality and um, <clears throat> precision it used to have. So it's well behind no. the project development. I, I don't know what the state is today, but I know back when Sun was a going concern, the set of documentation for Solaris A and, and Open Solaris that you could get from them that literally took up a bookshelf, well, uh, one shelf hmm. was quite good. And then they had a digital copy of the same thing. And uh, Michael Lucas books for the rather EOS open source projects he covers are very approachable and go far enough for learning oriented books, those are about his writing style and his attention to detail are about right. And his sense of humor. Yes, and it's important because oftentimes the uh, subjects are very dry otherwise. Until you get to a point where you are interested in the technology and want to learn more about it and get to a point where you can get creative with it. Yeah. So maybe uh, we have to get him drunk and have, and have him promise to write a beehive book. <laughs> uh, I, one that's come up too, he cannot drink. He says he'd die, which is great because I can often get his drink tickets and Alan's drink tickets at events, but that's ne neither here nor there. Okay, bribe um, uh, him with gelato. Gelato, correct. That is the correct answer. Rodney, gold standards of example documentation from cruise missiles to you name it. Not going to cite anything. Okay. <laughs> uh, and 
Carvin and Hans, who are to this open discussion, totally open to ideas and suggestions. Go ahead. The original gold standards were the BSD PDF papers, or the post, actually, they were postscript, I think is how they were shipped in binary format. But their NROF documents that were in user share doc, those are the original gold standard. There's about 10 papers on various aspects of the BSD system itself. We don't even, I don't even think they're in tree anymore. The old uh, BSD4 handbook is still available somewhere. Oh, cool. But. Oh, and how did Greg Leahy's book relate to the handbook as, as I stare across the room to one? He had this massive, massive tome. Yeah, the complete free BSD, I believe by Greg Leahy, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. Does anyone present have uh, a list of areas they would like the most light to be shown on that they consider the least documented and most worthy of attention. Storage and network device pass through and compatible hardware. Pass through? So slam your so, HPA into a VM or what? Exactly, something like that. And which vendors are known to work? Um, just which drivers have been tested in which previous releases? So when did it pass the last progression test? Something like that. should maybe something like the Open WRT uh, wiki, which lists each uh, wireless router and the degree of support you can expect for a specific device or some family identified by chip or vendor or that type of thing maybe that's that's addressed by some kind of interactive um compatibility matrix page i think that would imply too much dependability and precision probably Unless in you're uh, you're some kind of system integrator um, in a position to ship known hardware in known configurations, something like a uh, Tronas box. Oh, but I mean, if if you got okay, this you know this chip works on these you know these versions, but it, uh, you know we know the driver wasn't developed until here. And that's to my mind useful. It is, but let's see, a, you have a main board based on the same chip, but with different firmware by different vendors. I don't know, uh, the super micro main board is out of stock and you have to get the AS Rock, REC, whatever closest equivalent or gigabyte because they're the only ones in stock right now. And their BIOS or UFI firmware is configured in some stupid way. For example, they claim it's a server board and they still disable a PCI pass through by default or stuff like that. Well, that's, yeah, that's exactly why I'm saying, you know, you need some kind of matrix is because there are so many different permutations. If you just try to do a list of, you know, supported hardware, I, I think you're going to be yeah, limited you to the point that it may some connection be between useful. them basically explaining how the interface between like, this is a main board, PCI cards go in. <laughs> we expect to be able to pass this, this and this and GPU user special because of the vBIOS or whatever and IO ports. 
uh, I've definitely seen that say HPE5 Xeon workstations do not support SRIOV despite the fact that the chip will gladly support it. So, and do you happen to know why and if it can be changed? Market segmentation, of course. Okay, so <laughs> I suspect it wasn't <laughs> forgotten about, they're uh, just uh, pricks. That could easily be. That's very rarely just forgotten about. It's usually them being pricks. I believe product management is the term one uses for <laughs> that team. Um, only in polite company. Okay, so we're almost at the hour. Any other concerns, observations, great examples of documentation we should model I ourselves? Posted, I posted a link to a GitHub that has the 4.4 BSD Lite 2 in both PDF and PostScript. Excellent. And looking back, would you describe them as white papers or education, uh, university materials? University materials. Many of them were written by either McCusick, Carls, Leffler, uh, possibly Bill Joy. Um, would you consider them a predecessor to the design and implementation of FreeBSD book? I, the, I realized the link I posted has PSD on the end of it, which is actually one of three sets of documentation. Um, there's, if you go up uh, one level, I think there'll be three separate directories, PSD, SMM, and Correct. Well, there's the other one. Um, USD, PSD, and SMM. Yes. I'll update the link. Yeah. Rodney, if you're on video, is this them? Is that an example? Hang on. If you're on video. If not, uh, I got to get, I I can't, I, I just got to get the other screen up. Okay. Um, what were you holding up? I'm holding up BSD, 44 BSD Berkeley Software Lab Programmers Reference Manual, Use that's, Association that, and O'Reilly. Same or different? That's the PRM. Okay, that's the PR. That's the PRM. You're looking. You're you're looking for the volume in that called the PSD, and I'm not sure if the four four set included, but I it did. If you have Kirk's, Kirk helped get that put together. The four four manual set that was was finished and published by O'Reilly. Okay. I believe there is there there'll be a vol, an SMM volume and a PSD volume, and and yeah. th those are the papers that are in there. Okay. Yes, I do. I've been collecting those over the years, and <laughs> Keith from Plug kindly gave me. Yeah, I think I. Hard, and you may have. Yeah, I think I, I have. I had an original 4.3 set, but I think that's gone now. Um, I had, actually, I had a 4.2 set as well. Uh -oh. It was I actually laser printed. Um, but like I said, those have basically those have been maintained with each of the releases. And, the, and like I said, they were maintained by CSRG. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, but what so far I think has been overlooked is that the user expect expectations have shifted. So uh, most of us may be uh, quite content with a well-written book. Mm the next generation of users demands different uh, kinds of documentation. They actually do like to see uh, recorded Twitch streams, uh, <laughs> video tutorials and stuff like that. And different uh, expectations. <laughs> so. Yeah, and the follow on to some of this documentation, I mean, Kirk, I believe, has published two design and implementation books. Uh, four, three, four, four, and five, one. No, no, or... no, no. Um, I published. Um, 
I thought there were two versions of that. Yeah, there are two versions of that. He published one with George Neville Nill, yep. and he published another one with George and Watson. Yep. And um, the second and the four, one three is book. from uh, 2014. Yep. Yeah. After, so 10 years after the first uh, edition. Right. And And well, I guess it's really sure. user documentation as it's an academic operating systems design and implementation cross workbook, uh, which is also of interest to a de developer, but not to a new user. Only a desperate production user would grab it to understand why things are breaking if no one replies. <laughs> and uh, Andy and Hans, Andrew, sorry, uh, thinking of Andy with oh, Omni OS, they've, they've been pretty good with, I guess, a wiki or their web page, whatever form it takes, but with the various distributions of Illumos, are they, I don't know, is there any unified effort to document Illumos as a whole, or is it just distro specific, plus really old Sun pages with Oracle names on them now? I'm not sure if that's being driven at the parent level or at the actual uh, distro level to be honest that's okay so we're at a few minutes past the hour shall we share any last thoughts and wrap this up uh Jan observed about the broken sun docs. And yes, it's funny, you still find articles from like Matt Aaron's and then lots of broken links. It's a bit frustrating. It's remarkably anything ZFS related generally shows the Oracle documentation, despite the fact that it's arguably a, at times of what, a decade old? And the way Mac machine is your friend, good point. Well, gang, yeah. it was, go ahead, Andrew. I was gonna say, I think there's been some effort to reproduce some of that information on sites outside of Oracle's control. And then, especially for the stuff where like you're talking about the fault management, Damon, uh, point to the new versions of it. So whenever that comes up, we have a link to something that you can actually use. And the uh, Open ZFS uh, project broke up the unmanageably large ZFS man pages into sub man pages, just like uh, Git commands uh, to make them more approachable. They uh, wrote a few new ones to uh, explain concepts or to collect the uh, data set and pool wide properties. And those are also available online. And so the Open uh, ZFS project does provide reference documentation but no, and there are plenty of uh, uh, ZFS tutorials to get you started with your first Z pool uh, of very um, uh, fluctuating quality, depending on who wins the Google lottery this week. But it's available. And the FreeBSD handbook does provide Basics, the installer does the same setup. So why not? That's not that's a good place to be. I... And I'll just interject. I wish it was illegal for people to just duplicate a manual page and slam ads around it and win the Google lottery, as you put it. That is just so frustrating. <sighs> but what I've often experienced in hacker spaces, um, people who want 
to use things without wanting to spend the annoying time to learn them. So uh, somewhere you get your local uh, copy and paste experts who only copy and paste uh, from tutorials or even worse the stack overflow questions instead of their answers. <laughs> So uh, good documentation should guard against this by using maybe a syntactically invalid name component or something so that you really have to touch each line that you can't just copy and paste mm -hmm. a working right. line. Take care, folks. You have read it once. Hmm. And we have to, uh, by definition, they did try to search for things and obviously didn't find it and ended up on stock Stack Overflow. So, I mean, I'm not. I, I'm Sorry. not necessarily sure that I agree with that. I mean, I, I get where you're coming from, but from the other side, I don't think that putting an impediment to the user is necessarily helpful. No, not an impediment, but if you provide a ready to use shell script, which can be applied without any understanding, without having even really read through the code, you're not helping the difference between giving someone a fish and teaching them to fish. And so don't- the, well, uh, but the, issue, the issue is that there's a certain amount of users who are users and they are not interested in learning how to fish. Exactly. And for those, you need abstractions and not cop and a copy and pasteable tutorial in the bookmarks section of a browser as a bad form of uh, automation and abstraction. Because one sometimes they will copy only all but the last line. <laughs> it's fine to have some kind of automation, maybe a mini beehive or Take care, Rodney. Package, you just PKG install and uh, it does everything for you. It asks you questions. That's very useful. There's nothing wrong with that. If it's implemented as a wrapper around a nice API, it even provides a clean way to grow. But just getting stuck at this stage of copy and pasting without understanding. <laughs> Yeah, well, and it doesn't help that everything we touch is a moving target with active development, which is often a good thing, but that may change behavior, which challenges documentation and those wanting to fly forward with development don't want to keep up with documentation all the time. And it's as a challenge you, and we wouldn't be having this conversation if it was a solved problem. As long as the old way works and backward compatible interfaces are maintained, Mm -hmm. Let's add new things, as long as it doesn't make the code unmaintainable, mm -hmm. more power to them. Mm -hmm. It's unreasonable I... to expect someone to write tons of documentation just because they wanted to contribute their improvement if it doesn't add a large maintenance burden to the project. There's no real open documentation community, just like there's an open source community, which, uh, or if there is one, it pales in size. Composed. Well, documentation is a very, it tends to be a very different thing to be doing than, you know, than writing code and it's a exactly. different mentality. And I think, at least for most people, it's a lot less rewarding to write documentation. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that, um, I think it's unfortunate, but. You only write documentation because you've learned through experience that the alternative is worse. Uh, and then oftentimes only enough of it to at least to help you to remember in the future or someone with a similar skill set. But really writing good technical 
self uh, improvement books, no, however you want to call them, is a skill set of own, something which authors like uh, Michael Lucas have uh, mastered, but probably none of us ever will. And some people give conference talks. True. And as long as those are um, recorded in a reasonable quality and publicly available for free, it's a great information source. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. It's even better if you get uh, searchable uh, slides as well, so that you can quickly skip through things to know if it, the talk yep. could be worth watching. I will gently fault the FreeBSD magazine for going with a PDF format than a completely searchable online web uh, format. Yes. And, with and it was behind a paywall at one point, which didn't help. <laughs> Further didn't help. Exactly. Mm. But the quality, but the content is very high quality. So that's the challenge. It's like, well, please, please let's get it out there <laughs> aggressively. And for a while, that wasn't even really available as PDF, but as DRM encumbered PDF with a mm. strange online reader, which it was terrible. Okay. Sorry. Uh, the user experience was really user hostile. Okay, gang. Uh, good, timely topics. Um, as long as we have maybe someone with a uh, Solaris experience here, um, is anyone of you guys familiar with uh, SMF, Solaris Management Facility? A little. And uh, where I could find few. some design documentation on it because I'm considering writing something where I want to study the prior art so that we don't end up with another system D. Um, <laughs> so. um, shoot, the last time I last time I needed that it was it was still on by son and I think Ben Rockwood had a bunch of stuff on it. It was really good, but a lot of his stuff is no longer on his site. <laughs> Not yes, sure what happened to, there. We probably get to th uh, thank Larry for that. He needed another America's Cup yacht. Um, you might you, you might ask in the uh, in either the. Uh, yes. Service management on the OS or Lumos um, IRC channels, if that's if that's an mm -hmm. option for you. It is, and I can I'll, and I can look up and see what I what I can what I can find. So, what I'm interested in in is why what's their data model? How do they represent the problem space, and why did they end up with that uh, representation? Yeah, and I mean, it basically it comes. Doc. It basically okay. comes down to there's an there's an XML schema that mm -hmm. that, that deals with with the whole thing. Yes, I posted I a design that. doc on creating new modules that are XML. It might be useful. Thanks. Sure. Maybe it is. And uh, no, that isn't really helpful. I've, that okay. PDF I already have. A... You have it. <laughs> well, yeah, you found it too. Good, good, good. I know. I know. For me, mm. for me at least, the big reason I like um, SMF compared to um, uh, System D mm. is that in order is that when you bring in System D, you bring in everything else. True. Uh, I mean, System you, D is is a form of cancer. Yeah, it touches everything. And it's like, this is not reasonable. It's not. SMF, SMF does one thing. Mm -hmm. It boots, it, you know, it boots your system and makes sure all of your, your daemons stay running. That's it. So are you familiar with the daemon tool familiar, fam, uh, family of process supervisors? Um, DJB, daemon tools, run it. Uh... I, I've, I've 
seen some of them and, and done some messing, but not, but not super closely. Because uh, that's what I've been using for the last, on, by now almost decade, with uh, S6RC as the latest uh, one, which finally adds um, service management instead of just a process start up and restarting. And I found that system the unit files, while the idea of a unit file, a declarative syntax to describe a service startup is a good idea, I think. But the way they did it is terrible because uh, they're just describing the implementation details and they forgot to model some things before they started implementing. <laughs> it's just a mess cannot express certain concepts which need expressing do you want to do things correctly. John, what is the S6 license and Oh, yeah, I can language? check that. Um, it's written in C, C uh, and with, built with make files. Okay. Uh, uh, I can just drop the link. Uh, da, 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 da. So this is the starting page of the whole thing. Yep, darn it. Well, oh, that website's as bad as mine. <laughs> as dated as mine. Love it. Oh, no, no, it's still maintained. And, and, and active I didn't say dated, I said primitive. <laughs> yes, that it is. Intentionally. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So uh, it's all under ISC license. Oh, there it is. Boom. And uh, I think he still runs regression tests on some variant of Solaris. He does run FreeBSD and OpenBSD tests at, before releasing. So uh, it's been rather pleasant to maintain <laughs> as nice. maintainer because it doesn't require any patching. <laughs> what a concept. Yeah. So the, the idea here is that this, uh, back in the 90s, DJ Bernstein found out that back then uh, Unix was a mess and everyone was broken in three different ways, at least. Uh, maybe HP uh, Sachs was uh, broken in five. Uh, so he came up with a Whopper library uh, because things like get peer name and so on wasn't usable. The, um, then, um, Lip became libdjb, and this is what scarlips grew out of. Mm -hmm. Just your safe containers and so on in C, because you don't want to uh, to rewrite string concatenation operations and so on every time. Then you get a with exact line a very simple scripting language, which is designed for uh, having a very t small implementation, a safe. Uh, expansion of variables, so no a sane quoting semantics compared to the grown POSIX shell behavior. Uh, and it's all implemented as rewriting the argument vector. So instead of keeping the interpreter uh, resident, the it transforms the argument vector and xx, which does not scale for large scripts, but it's only designed to chain load things like change the user directory, apply resource limits, and execute the next stage. Change your effective user, execute the daemon. So you're not supposed to write long scripts in it. Is this a one person show? Almost. There are a few other contributors, but there's one primary developer. And where does one contribute? Uh, one joins the IRC channel and says, says hello and joins the mailing list and logs. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, um, SMF's approach actually doesn't really embed any kind of scripting into it. Oh, it's, the scripting it's... isn't embedded into it, but it's offered because you need something like it and shell scripts are hard to write and template correctly. 
there's one place and only one place where it's embedding that uh, log rotation, uh, post processing after the log rotation. That's the only thing it's embedded. And even there, it's behind an if def so that you can remove the dependency and lose support with a simple way and only use shell scripts for that. Well, what I'm getting at is um, basically SNF is purely declarative. You declare mm -hmm. this is how you start whatever service it is. These are the other services I know about that it runs or that it needs in order to be able to load. So you can mm -hmm. get that ordering. So, but at the same time you're getting that ordering, you're also getting which ones you can start uh, simultaneously. So you get that, yes. that parallel startup functionality as well. My criticism with the uh, FreeBSD the RC script system is that it's all written in shell. It's all stringly typed and several supposed maintainers are afraid of, of touching it. That's, because, that can be an issue. Because for example, the NetIF script probably has grown a mind of its own and nobody wants to add to it because uh, it tends to bite back if you uh, touch <laughs> it. And it's not, and the other thing is for something like embedded devices uh, or mobile devices or laptops or, or even desktop, it's too static. Um, networks change, you t take your FreeBSD laptop if you still run one, uh, you plug it in at home, you want it to do connect directly to your home server, you take it along on the road, you want the VPN to come up automatically. The existing system doesn't really support that kind of dynamic configuration. You can script around it, but the uh, Jan, does that make you a next BSD fan where Jordan and company ported the Apple contraption? I did run their both of their draft ISOs in a virtual machine yeah. and found several kernel panics in their Mark IPC port. And it was totally abandoned. It was a nice, it was really nice to give it a spin and find out how this kind of stuff works. I'm not a fan of LaunchD because it suffers from a similar design flaw as SystemD in that it puts far too much code and policy into the init binary. And the other thing is, but that's more because of its age rather than fundamental for us that it uses a lot of bloated XML. I would prefer a different config format, but that's uh, just a style question. The important thing is that it's too complex and it puts the, the complexity in things where, uh, in places where it's really dangerous to have lots of complexity. This is where S6 is a lot better designed. Have any OSs used S6 as its init system? Uh, I, think Vo I think Void Linux is looking at uh, using it as its primary init system. Any others? Take a um, the problem with doing that is that what's missing is the S6 front end. So, for, so far, because the software is written bottom up, you have the uh, service supervisor or process supervisor, which just knows how to start a service in a clean environment when instructed to do so and restart it if it fails. That's a useful layer, but it's not something you want to run on, well, your system on. This, this S6RC is the service manager to handle things like dependency tracking, uh, side effects, like so that you can have one-shot scripts and long-running scripts or demons, those have to be configured to stay in the foreground if you don't want to use hacks and so on, but hey, it works. Mm, okay. uh, it's really well designed, but it's so correct that the, it's getting in the way. So it's cumbersome to use because you have to get everything correct. You have to specify things. You can't take short circuit, uh, shortcuts because it doesn't let you. Which is, in one way, it's a good thing, but it's too uh, hard to use without automation. And even with automation, it's a bit um, tedious to automate because you have to get very granular about it. But so what's missing is a nice, easy to use front end 
which is in a work in progress, but isn't uh, developing quickly because the, the primary developer has to uh, pay for uh, other expenses. And his is there a nickname for that project? Uh, S6 Frontend? Yeah, I'm searching a uh, six front and there it is. <laughs> it's literally yeah, that. It's, okay. It's in development and uh, he did put out uh, basically a call for sponsoring. <laughs> did he know? Yeah. Was he in Vienna? He seems to be. No, he wasn't. Hmm. But one of the nice things about his uh, software is that he uh, ex demands even of contributors to make sure to stay within the for the portable parts, which aren't ex uh, part of the exclusive Linux only projects to restrict themselves to portable APIs and don't use things which aren't portable, even if it requires two system calls more and a bit more thinking. Hey, had me at ISC. That's cool. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, that is enough far... information ingested. Anything else? Final. I was going to say, as Final far as uh, <laughs> init systems go, I've kind of developed this opinion that there's really room for two ways of, you know, of, of at least two ways of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. uh, one for super lightweight system, you know, installations. So particularly stuff like uh, where you're talking about either embedded systems or you're talking about things like, um, um, what do you call it? Like Docker type systems. Yeah, containers, containers, jails. Yeah, and jails, then, whatever. And then another one, that is maybe full featured to cover larger, you know, a, a laptop larger. You described, right? Yeah, I, I really think those are different enough use cases that it that it's really almost unreasonable to expect a single system to cover both. Interesting. That's a good observation. Mm, yes and no. Uh, Because I don't see a reason why it couldn't be done if you separate mechanism and policy correctly and make it modular enough that you just can not include certain mechanisms, helper demons and so on on the embedded systems. And Apple has proven that the bloated uh, in its system like launch D with lots of changes works very well on mobile devices, the iPhones in particular, and even on Apple watches. And it does save them uh, power and battery life to have a big fat in its system to, uh, which is able to find unused services and ask them to release their resources. So with a transactional model and so on and supporting socket activation so that if, you, for example, uh, your service can be exited or suspended to disk basically, depending on which level of support it has, and then be restarted quickly without the user ever noticing because the service interface, the socket or Mac IPC port was never unavailable because the init system was always waiting for a client. Hmm. The problem with this dynamic approach that everything is socket activated is that uh, there are no guarantees. So it can always explode at one time, which is why it doesn't work for safety critical systems. Uh, no, no, system, system D isn't what Apple is using. Oh, we got to launch D, right? Um, you're right, thank you. Um, and no. The problem with LaunchD is that it's a very complex beast and it's written for the desktop use case and may now the mobile use case. Uh, 
I'll admit I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the mobile use case, so. Um, one of the problems is that you really care about power consumption and especially dynamic power consumption. So you want to waste the least amount of power over a given day or something like that. Mm. And it has to be responsive to the user when they use it. And for that socket activation makes a lot of sense, for example, because the super server is always listening and as you spawn it on demand and if it's used often enough, you just keep it around. Does S6 have any notion of socket awareness and activation? Uh, yes, it does, uh, but it does, but it does the absolute minimum mechanism. It has to um, because there is a separated support daemon to hold file descriptors uh, for safekeeping so that you can get the listening socket back if you need to. Hmm. That's all that's required uh, to have one always uh, running daemon which must not crash because then you're losing its file descriptors. But it's a very, very small daemon, uh, a handful of memory pages basically to uh, listen on a Unix domain socket, apply a a policy to clients to very, uh, check if they're allowed to store or retrieve this name and then uh, have them store or retrieve this name. And because it's such a tiny demon, if you need a second one to make your life easier, you, you can just run a second instance of it. And so that's there. What isn't there is the bloated API system you did around them, you could re-implement them if you wanted to. You said bloated API? Um, System D has APIs where you, um, similar to what Apple does. Mm. So the problem is that for a high performance service, something like your Nginx web server, if you actually expect a real world load, you don't want to um, spawn uh, a client process per connection like Apache used to do mm -hmm. under the, the, uh, INET-D. But now you have a problem that you, the INET-D model only works with one process per connection. What do you do with a listening socket? How do you get that into the uh, daemon? So mm. You could do something like, uh, if what's possible is that you can have the super server listen, uh, basically um, wait for the uh, for there to be something to be accepted. So if the backlog contains at least one connection request, you start the service and it has to retrieve its uh, already uh, bound and listening socket, it's maybe more than one of them, for example, one for IPv4, one for IPv6, and has to add them to the, the event loop and just skip the uh, create socket creation uh, binding and listening and just start accepting incoming connections. But for some reason they didn't do it that way in systemd. I think they accept the first connection and then pass the first connection and all listening sockets hmm. for whatever reason. Or was it Apple who did it that way around? That's why I said bloated API there already taking the first connection out of the uh, listening socket. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And due to the uh, some hallway track discussions at UBSD con, I got re my interest uh, got reawoken to look into what's possible in FreeBSD with the given uh, system calls in user space. And I found out that everything that was missing uh, has been implemented in the meanwhile. So we finally ha have event file descriptors, which take care of um, aggregating missed events so that you don't deadlock if something is unresponsive. Uh, what does that look like or sound like? Um, let's say you have- Oh, is uh, there a project name in FreeBSD? Like no, no, user space a... system calls? No, no. Sorry, in that case, the problem is, um, let's say I want to not get notified if the system state changes. Yeah. 
so that I want to respond to a hot plug event or if some service goes up, I want to be notified. If it goes down too. Okay. So I subscribe for some kind of notification. Ah. But if I then don't consume my notification, the system has to buffer them or it has to discard them. Hmm. Uh, neither are good because just discarding them require can uh, result with the consumer getting out of sync and the consumer has to be notified that he's out of sync and know how to poll or uh, has to always poll so that the uh, notification is only an optimization, which is very wasteful uh, in a mobile use case. And the other alternative is to make everything um, reliable, but reliable multicast is uh, prone to deadlocks. Now the problem is that if some a consumer doesn't consume because I don't know, you, you attached something and then ran control Z, uh, type control Z and suddenly you, you, your event consumer is suspended the process and your whole system stops working. And maybe it's a graphical terminal and something else requires an event to be processed and now your system can't uh, be used when you're deadlocked because you can't even switch to the TTY, for example, without mm. it. Something like that. It shouldn't happen, but it can happen. Okay. Or something falls behind far enough. And the nice thing is that uh, the uh, event file descriptor can be used. It's a special file descriptor type, which got added in FreeBSD 13. Uh, Linux ha had it for a while. Do, do you it's know the name of it? Uh, event FD, is, I think is the system call to create a new one. Uh, so um, the thing about an event, it's basically a counting semaphore or a counter. Yeah, just uh, you read a 64-bit counter value and reading implicitly resets the counter. And because it's a 64-bit counter, it won't overflow at runtime if you perform even the slightest bit of weight limiting. <laughs> I think I found it. It is an event FD from 13. Writing a 64 bit value to it just uh, increments the counter. Hmm. There are two modes for, to it, uh, counter and semaphore. In the semaphore, you are reading uh, just decrements the, sem the counting semaphore by one. And that's it. And it's a very easy to use interface. And if I make it uh, use this type of system uh, call or interface, I can support demons acting as controllers to respond to reconfiguration at runtime. So let's see uh, uh, so the an in Ethernet interface linked state changes. I want to dynamically uh, notice this with something like DevD. And now I want to start some service because this service has been dynamically started. Something depending on it, which is, wants to start, suddenly gets started up as well mm. because its dependencies are now met. So let's say, um, I don't know, um, maybe I can my Ethernet gets plugged in and the DHCP client gets started. The DHCP mm -hmm. client uh, gets a lease so it becomes ready. It signals this interface is ready and signals the, the something observable, say, I have an internet connection and signal sets a, a state which says, I'm in this network environment just by convention. And then you notice, oh, I'm in the network uh, uh, setup uh, or network. My networking scripts have de detected I'm in state. I'm a network road warrior. So time to start the uh, VPN clients, time to start IPsec tunnels or stuff like that, or WireGuard these days. And all of this without polling all the time. And right, and right. Interesting. Interesting. And that's a good description. That's what, or this is the user facing part and the mobile user. But yeah. there's also the part about complex enough uh, 
jail and beehive hosting like if a virtual machine is exits with this exit code maybe it should be restarted maybe it shouldn't be restarted depending on the access code or if the jail goes up or down to this or that um, or don't create this jail before you have created its uh, vnet settings and so on so if i want to bring up this vnet enabled jail i have to create a dynamically have something dynamically allocate a epair interface for it yeah <clears throat> yeah so cool okay and i'm interested in how, how the what mechanisms are required to for this kind of thing and which ones are hurtful so that i can learn from prior art and don't repeat avoidable mistakes mm -hmm. should i be insane enough to touch the init system question yet again <laughs> because uh, the problem is that after system deeds all scorched off nobody wants to touch because of how bad the discussion was last time around and how tragic the result was mm. uh, but still and solaris has something to offer there but i don't i like familiarity with solaris and well supported hardware for it and so i just wanted to ask if there's somebody who can tell me about the solaris service management facility and where i should look and uh, for bi for example you may want to dynamically create if i um, want to start this tenant's guest i have to make sure that the networking for it is also present so maybe i have to create yeah. a vxlan interface uh, do some BGP reconfiguration and so on, that it, the overlay con connecting all of these tenants uh, machines is present on the host. Was there a talk at the conference about that? No, not directly. Oh, you just heard I it think. in the hallway track? Uh, I thought about it a while ago and asked in the hallway track. <laughs> okay. And brought it up in the hallway track to ask those who talked about networking in the various beehive or uh, um, jail related talks and uh, yeah uh, and cool and some discussion about does freebsd need something like iou ring save it for next time <laughs> yep i have cool. to go as well Okay, take care, everyone. Thank you, Jan and Andrew. Always a pleasure. I will call it at 43 after. And see almost, some of you in a week. Almost twice as long. <laughs> well, that's nothing. Oh, Jan and I have gone <laughs> Sorry. absolutely off the rails wild. Great. Thank you, everyone. Talk to you. Have a good one. Take care. Bye. Bye.